Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is taken from our Gospel lesson, the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11, as read a few moments ago. Dear fellow redeemed in Christ. The story is told about uh, the baptism of King Angus by St. Patrick in the middle of the 5th century. Sometime during the rite, St. Patrick leaned on his sharp pointed staff and inadvertently stabbed the king's foot. After the baptism was over, St. Patrick looked down at all the blood and realized what he had done and immediately begged the king's forgiveness. Why did you suffer this pain in silence? St. Patrick wanted to know. The king replied, I just thought it was part of the ritual. <laughs> Institutions and individuals all have their rituals. Case in point, I don't know if you caught it at the last Packer game when the Packers played the Lions. Aaron Rodgers re-injured his calf while throwing a touchdown pass to Randall Cobb. After going into the locker room for treatment, cameras keyed in on Rodgers as he was seen, did you catch it? Tugging the beard, tugging the beard of one Jeremy Wilcox for good luck. Sports players are notorious for having special and oftentimes unexplainable rituals performed before and during their games. And God knows that humans are very ritual-oriented. Uh, even our daily schedules are rituals in a sense. Think about what you did this morning. It probably was filled with some sort of ritual. Maybe you hit the snooze button twice. Not three times because that would make you late. And not once because you needed that extra nine minutes of sleep. And so you hit it two times because you want to do, because that's just what you do. It has become your ritual of sorts. You always hit it twice. Mornings and evenings are notorious for rituals. We do things in a certain way in order to fall asleep or when we wake up. After church, some of you are probably will go out for brunch. It's just kind of your ritual. It's what you do. Maybe your kids come over to your house and you spend time as a family. Maybe the guys go in the other room and watch the football game. It's a ritual. It's what we do. We all have our rituals. Even our spiritual life is filled with all kinds of ritual. Prayer time is a ritual of sorts. Some of us pray at night. Others pray in the morning. Some of us pray at both. I guess it was, I guess it was something that my parents instilled in me. When I was young, my mom always came and said our prayers right before we went to bed. When I got older, she would always remind us to say our prayers at night. And I know if I happen to fall asleep without saying my prayers, I feel guilty because um, I didn't do it the night before. If we think about it, the Old in the Old Testament, God gave the Israelites rituals not only as a form of worship, but also to bring order and health and well-being to his people. When they broke those rituals, things started to unravel. Even our Sunday mornings are filled with rituals. Not every Lutheran congregation follows the exact format, but the important parts of the liturgy are observed nearly everywhere. The reason we have an organized worship service is to ensure things are done in an orderly and God-pleasing manner. Furthermore, rituals, when done over and over, can be used as teaching tools. For example, if we didn't confess the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed on a regular basis, would we be able to say them from memory? 
Probably not. In our gospel lesson for today, John the Baptist introduces a new ritual of repentance and cleansing with water. Today, we call this ritual holy baptism. And actually, the Bible says that baptism is more than a ritual. It is a means by which God delivers his gifts to his people. Now, if you've ever had the opportunity to look into the baptismal font during a baptism, what would you see? Water. Water. Plain old, simple water from the tap, H2O. It's ordinary water, but that water delivers an extraordinary gift. And what makes this water so special? Well, one, it is water by which God, through his promise, claims us as his children. And two, it is water by which God, through his promise, empowers us to live as his people. So you see, it's not the water that's special at all, but it is God's promise through his word that is connected to that water. That is what is special. Water. It's one of the most common elements in our world. Water of some sort or another is everywhere and in everything. 60% of the, of the surface of the world is covered with water. Similarly, 60% 60 of our bodies are made up of water. Water is rain falling from the sky. It is the humidity in the summer, sticky summer air, things that we don't know much to about this time of year. We know more about the other kind of water that's drifting over as the winter winds blow. There's water in lakes and water in streams and water in rivers. There are all kinds of aquifers that are running underneath the ground where we get our water from to drink. There's water in clouds. Water is a common element. And it is, it is the only thing that we see in baptism. It is the only thing that we see that is poured over the head in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And it is the common element we see in our gospel reading for today. In the hand of a common man like John the Baptist and poured over the head of our Savior Jesus Christ. But make no mistake, my friends, it is not that Jesus needed this baptism. Quite the contrary, if there was anyone who did not need baptism, it was Jesus. You see, John's baptism was about repentance and forgiveness. And since he was perfect, Jesus did not need to repent. And since he was sinless, Jesus did not need forgiveness. Then we might wonder, why did Jesus insist on being baptized? Well, Jesus himself answers this question. He says, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. It is proper for Jesus to be baptized to, fill, to fulfill all righteousness. You see, if Jesus was going to be like us, if he was going to be our substitute, he must do the things that we do and live the life that we live. Only he must do it perfectly. And that's exactly what he did. And God the Father approved of the path his son took. The Bible says that immediately after Jesus was baptized, heaven was opened and the Spirit came down upon him, and a voice, God the Father's voice, was heard saying, You are my Son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. 
since St. Paul says in Romans 6 that our baptism unites us with Jesus, we can say with confidence that God the Father is pleased at our baptism and at every baptism that is done according to his command. Now, some people may view the rituals in the church as silly and going through the motions. However, rituals do have a purpose. Holy baptism marks the recipient as a child of God, clothed in Christ by the Holy Spirit. It is a means by which God delivers his gift of forgiveness, and it is the guarantee that we, through faith, will inherit the kingdom of God. Holy baptism is just one more ritual God provides to assure us of his love. I invite you now to pray with me as we thank the Lord for the gift of holy baptism. Thank you, Lord, for understanding our need for structure in our lives and for, for providing rituals that remind us of the love you have for us and the gift of salvation provided by Jesus Christ and delivered through holy baptism. 